the past is in the past, man. Just uh, whatever your history is, it doesn't uh, it it doesn't paint the picture of your future. So just uh, daily compounding action. Whatever your goal is, whether you're an established business owner, uh, the message still stays true. Whether you're a new to business and you're going into a different industry, uh, just get one percent better. Just do a, a new task every single day. All right, Dustin, welcome to the show, man. Man, thanks for having me, man. I'm excited for today. Absolutely, brother. It's a beautiful day. Today's Thursday. What is it? December 2nd, is it? Yeah? Or December, is it? Yeah, the 2nd. Man, yeah, the second. The year's almost Time's over, flying. bud. 2020's <laughs> almost gone, man. I can't I can't wait, but I, I, I'm, I feel like 2021 is not going to be much different. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's holding out their hopes, but 2021's not showing much better. So, right, oh, man, this stuff is crazy, bro. How's things holding up in your neck of the woods, bro? Uh, they're holding up good over here. Um, Idaho's been pa- fairly slow. We kind of actually reversed back to stage two. Um, you know, I decided to actually have a baby during this time, so nice. <laughs> I got a COVID Congrats. baby. <laughs> so yeah, thanks, man. Uh, it's definitely been an experience. It's fun. <laughs> Yeah, man. Yeah, things are crazy, bro. Were, uh, were there any like, well, I'm sure there were, but like security and safety protocols at the hospital when you were going through that process? Man, it kind of sucks because with a first kid, you want to experience all the things firsthand. But um, I was only able to go to one ultrasound, and then and the rest, you weren't. I wasn't allowed to go in because it was there was no guests. I'm like, I'm the dad. I'm not a guest. <laughs> yeah, bro. But yeah. That sucks, yeah, that man. Crazy. Dude, so I just missed the cutoff because uh, my daughter was born January 29th. Ooh. And like and like a week later is when COVID started to like start popping up everywhere. Yeah. So luckily enough, I was able to go to those. My uh, wife and I, we um, we renewed our vows on February 22nd on our anniversary. So we had a big like wedding celebration because we just eloped. And we caught right at the front, too. Like We actually had all the family come in. Nobody got COVID. Nobody had issues. We had a big party. Yeah. And uh, so we got lucky. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right at the edge. Like the next day, it was just crazy. Crazy, man. And now they're saying, I was reading a couple articles yesterday. They're saying that COVID was actually circulating in the States before January. They're saying yeah. that this was circulating in, in, in during Christmas time. Yeah, yeah. Um, my grandma's got lung issues and she was in the hospital for a little while. They couldn't figure out what it was. Um, it was some bacteria in her lungs and causing lots of issues and they had no idea. And then come to think of it later down the road, the doctors are like, well, it might've been COVID. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. she had that going on in like November, December. Crazy, I was like, oh, man. Yeah. It's wicked. They're able to like do blood samples like from months and months and months ago and found like the antibodies in the blood and I don't know for the, for the listeners out there, look into it. It's, it's pretty crazy stuff, but anyways, Enough of the COVID talk, man. We're here to talk <laughs> about you, brother. So welcome to the show, man. It's a pleasure to have you here again. And uh, for the viewers and listeners that aren't familiar with you and your work, would you mind to just give us a kind of like a brief overview of what you're all about? Yeah, man. Um, so started out in the fitness industry and uh, built that uh, business kind of up and figured out I, I didn't like trading hours for uh, money. So exited that, but still enjoyed the fitness, the fitness space and wanted to help people on a massive scale. So used my skills and sales and skills in marketing and building those businesses up to go into building my own marketing agency, primarily focused around the fitness industry at the get go right out the gate. And uh, the rest is history, man. I started that about seven years ago, been building it up. And uh, end game goal is to add, to have a nice lucrative exit uh, and continue building and just kind of see where that goes. I'm having lots of fun as uh, as the entire industry just constantly changes. Mm. So that's that's my primary bread. Um, other than that, I do uh, also love, love e-commerce. Marketing and e-commerce kind of go side by side. Uh, so I've got a couple brands that I'm building up there, and it's lots of fun. Sweet man, tell us more about the, the the fitness industry stuff, man. So what what does that really entail on your end? 
Uh, so when I went into it, I went in from the bottom, worked my way bottom to the top. And so I started as a personal trainer. Fitness was always a big thing for me, um, as well as, you know, what helping people get to the, you know, the areas that they want to enjoy the quality of life. Um, but when I went in, it's very cutthroat industry. And a lot of times, a lot of these old time, um, owners, they're still stuck in the old ways. So they'll just kind of turn, turn and burn, turn and burn, unless you have the, uh, the stamina or the, uh, the energy to kind of keep up with it. Uh, you'll find yourself out of the game really quickly. And so for the longest time I was up at like five in the morning, I was there till like eight at night doing 30 minute you know, sessions and back to back to back to back with, uh, including sessions, including the sales process. So I was just back to back, either training or selling the entire time. Uh, and I had the energy, I had the, the, the ability to keep going with that, but it was, it burns you out quick. Um, and so I figured, I would like to still help people, but I wanted to, I figured that I could actually train and develop because, you know, I was top of the game. I was building, I was slinging deals. I was closing deals. Uh, I wanted to learn on a more training upper, upper management level. So I wanted to maybe train some trainers. So let's just say I, I could transition. I could, I could put my information, my ethics, my morals, my sales process into other trainers. Then I can help more people that way. So then I went into training trainers um, and grew exponentially that way. Uh, from that point, then I went into running specific gyms, uh, and that was directly under uh, a friend of mine that was owning a gym. He went from about like a 4,000 square foot location. We opened up three 12,000 square foot locations, turned it into a, a couple million dollar company um, in the span of just a couple of years, uh, working on franchising and stuff. And uh, at, th at that point, it just... I figured I was putting all, I literally built this guy's business from the ground up and I was just not getting anything in return. Uh, this is this kind of guy that would just, you know, on a, on a call with the employees, he'd be like, Hey, um, you know, we got to work for our payroll. We don't got the money to, you know, to, uh, to do bonuses or, you know, we don't got the money to, you know, give out these, these high commissions or this or that or the other. And he'd come in and pull a draw, uh, a cash draw from the business and then blow like $1,500 at the strip club at night, you know, rolling around in his Mercedes and stuff. And he's just, you know, crap. So when I uh, went to actually transition out of that and go into either marketing or partnering or even just into another studio uh, myself, uh, the true colors of obviously his management and his leadership just showed. And he's just like, you never do anything. You know, you're too lazy or too this, you know, not understanding what uh, um, actually what he had there. And so when you tell me I can't do something, I do something. So obviously that was a, a, another fire to light underneath me. Um, and I used from all the information that, that I gained and all the experience that I gained from growing those businesses, I turned into uh, the agency and I turned into growing other businesses. Mm. Um, and so that's my way of also helping uh, businesses uh, on a much grander scale. So indirectly, I'm helping them help other people. So that's, that was my goal. Man, I could relate to you, bro. I could relate to what you just shared with us, man. Honestly, bro, fuck people like that. Straight up. Like, Bad. fuck people that pull shit like that. When you, when somebody is putting on for you, and they're bringing you results, and they're delivering as they promised, and doing what they said they were going to do, and then you hit them with the money's tight, we can't pay commissions and bonuses... But your other actions in your personal life speak way different, bro. Oh, yeah. You got to run away, man. That's unethical. And These I've seen that many out. times. I've seen that. It happens a lot, man. Oh yeah, they just try and live like little celebrities. They, especially in like I'm, I'm in Boise, Idaho. Uh, we're growing fast, but you know, everybody still knows everybody in this area, and he just wanted to flaunt it. You know, well, when you, I guess when you, you some people just aren't meant to uh to achieve money like that without the you know with the, when they're lacking the morals and the ethics they mm. just they kind of you got to take care of your people you know as, as a business owner you have to take care of your people uh, if you don't they're gonna leave <laughs> and when they leave your business might 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 not be doing as well right because it was because of the people that were getting you to where you were at in the first place that's All why man signs. commission stuff man it, it's dicey bro it's it's oh, dicey yeah. 
you know, everyone's always like, oh, commissions, commissions, but just make sure the company can actually pay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I would, uh, sometimes, I mean, I wouldn't even know if I would, but the funny thing is, is I would also know what would, what would be happening on the back end. And I'd be like, all right, like no matter what, I'm getting my money. Cause I know this guy's blowing it in other places. I'll take it from somewhere. But yeah, the signs were all there. Um, and since then, you know, he's kind of crashed and burned, but the signs were all there. I mean, the biggest complaint I think from members were nobody sticks around. There's always new people. I wonder why. <laughs> Mm. it's just turning and burning there's no culture there there's no you know no loyalty uh people were just in and out and in and out either because they hated him or because um obviously they couldn't survive off the income or they just saw that they could progress somewhere else on their own doing it themselves Mm. i i get it man i understand so you you departed that situation and you said that you started to develop and build your own agency Mm-hmm. Your your marketing agency is that right, or yeah. was it the fit the personal training uh, agency? Uh, I went I went the marketing route. Okay. Um, in in my area at that time, uh, a ton of studio. It was kind of the hype of the the boot camps and the CrossFit, and there was just a ton of them going around. And I was just like, I don't want to jump in and compete in the new market or anything. I'm going to take these skills and kind of almost immediately grab. Um, some clientele or something in China kind of maybe help these people uh, grow their businesses versus jumping in and and adding in as a competitor. And so I went into the marketing side, uh, went solely into the fitness side, uh, just because just like a lot of the old owners are in the industry, they're just, they're so uh, out of touch with technology and the times. And so they're just still kind of sticking to the old tactics uh, and so there was just a lot of opportunity there with getting people to transition and, and getting clients to to go. But my biggest thing after my experiences there were I, I only work with businesses that actually like give back to the com- community. Like if I'm going to meet with a business owner and I get the same feeling that they're, you know, pulling the same crap as that prior owner, then all I'm doing is feeding into that. And that's not something that I want to do. So I will pick and pick and choose, you know, businesses that are actually, you know, have their core values established, um, stand by them and actually put something back into the community. Mm. Yeah, man. You know, it's, it's always shocking to me how many businesses still in 2020 just don't have their marketing set up properly. It's crazy. I mean, even, even as little as a website, right? Like you got, (laughs) you got so many companies that don't even have mobile responsive websites. I I think it was last week. I was looking for a new restaurant to try in my area. You know, I like trying new spots out, support local businesses. I I pull up this one company's website, whatever, and it's like not mobile responsive. So it's like the desktop version. I'm like trying to like swipe all over my phone, try to like zoom in to pick like the menu to see. And it's it's, it's a mess. And, And there's a huge opportunity, right? I mean, anybody can create a marketing agency if they have enough drive to do so. I mean, you could pop on... You know, so many different websites, YouTube, and learn how to, um, you know, do this stuff and then just start calling business. Go Google every business in your town, see what their websites look like. If it looks like shit, call the owner and say, hey, I'll, f- I'll, I'll make this mobile responsive and spice it up for you for, you know, a thousand bucks. So yep. your customers can actually use your website. <laughs> Uh, it, it's crazy, man. It, it's, it's huge opportunity though. Yeah. Yeah. So many of them just kind of like, I mean, they, they, they cut the, the bottom of their own barrel and they just let it, let it seep out. Um, and what's funny is they're so, a lot of them are so just, just against going into the unknown, which is really funny with them as business owners. So they're like, I don't, I don't know that where I tried it and it didn't work or, um, I don't have the money for that, but you, they don't actually take into account the money that they're losing uh, is 10 times what they'd be spending to do it. Oh, man. Dude, I could talk about this all day, man. I got, <laughs> I, I have multiple bones to pick. So in, in, in the, I, I don't, I, I never really saw this in the South. I don't know. I, I don't know if it's a Northeast thing. Tell me about maybe Boise, but a lot of the mom and pop restaurants here, they have a thing where, they don't like to accept credit cards, right? It's like either it's yeah. cash only. They cash only places all over here. And it's the most annoying thing, man. Because, <laughs> I mean, 
I don't carry cash. I don't know. I just I don't really use cash, right? I use my Apple Pay and phone. So yeah. so there's this place that just opened down the block for me, man. This like pizza spot, and they have like a ten dollar minimum to for the credit card. It's a pizza spot, man. What am I gonna order? Ten slices of pizza just to meet your <laughs> minimum, you know? I just want a slice of pizza. That's it. But I can't because I don't have cash on me. So they're losing me as a customer because they don't want to pay a very small processing fee. Like, bro, get a square. It's free. They send it to you for free. And you can accept, <laughs> you can, like, you're losing business. I mean, a lot of companies think that they might be saving money by not paying the fee. He's like, oh, we're going to make our people pay cash. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to go if there's two places. I'm going to go to the one where I can, there's, yeah, like, what is yeah. this, man? It's 2020. It's crazy. I see a lot with mom, pop, mom and pop shops or brick and mortar businesses, local businesses, is they don't see past, uh, which is nationwide, worldwide right now. It's the instant gratification. They, get, they don't see fat past that first sale. It's like they're always trying to climb up the hill rather than establishing, you know, the next level of the hill and then growing to the next level. And they just have that that flat plane. You know, it's it's like in the gym business, EFT will set you free if you've got like, let's say your personal training and you've got them on a monthly rather than them paying in full. Then your normal monthly draft is going to be like 40,000, 50,000, 60,000 up versus trying to resell every single month and just constantly fighting to reach that same li level. And all these mom and pop shops, they're just, you know, they're only thinking of that one sale on the front end rather than the back end long, long term uh, profitability off of that. And that's that's the unfortunate thing that I see with a lot, a lot of business. Right. And, and, and I would add also customer satisfaction as well, because mm -hmm. like I want to patronize your business, but you're not letting me. <laughs> like you're making it inconvenient for me, right? So if I want to eat at your place, I have to then drive to the bank, go to the ATM, take out cash, then drive to – like it's, it's, a, it's a headache. Mm -hmm. But if you look at some of these other businesses, right, that, that don't have those roadblocks in the way. I mean you don't think before you go to a Starbucks or whatever, like a 7-Eleven, like, oh, I got to – I got to go to the ATM to take out cat. Like, no, because right. they're going to, they want you to shop there and they're willing to eat the fees. I don't know. It's just one of my like pet peeves, man. Business owners uh, out there, listeners, if that's you, please, you have to adjust. You, ha you don't, don't make it inconvenient for your customer to spend money with you. Especially right now. Yeah, that's really crazy that they're still doing that with uh, holding on to cash. Especially <laughs> right now. Yeah, yeah. man. I don't know. Maybe they're uh, trying to do some do some shady stuff, you know, <laughs> the under the table stuff. Yeah. Oh man, I don't know, dude. Cash is uh, cash is changing, you know. With everything yeah. is just digital, man. You got cryptos blowing up right now. Yep. It, it's un it's insane. You got all these different cards. I mean, I just got ten new cards in the last month. Everybody's got a card now. Yeah, yep. the Venmo card, the cash <laughs> card, the 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 Zelle, the this, the that. It's yeah, crazy, Apple. bro. <laughs> the Apple That's card. Crazy. Everybody's got the card. They're man. all trying to be a bank. That's it, brother. That's it. But um, so I think it's really cool, man. What you have going on? You you running the agency and 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 whatnot. Um, coming out of the fitness niche. Yep. Um, huge industry, man. It huge is, industry. and you know it's. Anybody going into the industry, one thing I would say is is obviously like at first glance, you would see that it's it's very saturated. And sometimes you'll you'll be like, oh, I'm just going to be diving into the piranha pool with, you know, thousands and thousands of other people. But the thing is that nobody lasts. You know, they go in, they're short lived. They've got a lot of energy up front. And those are the ones creating a bad name for the rest of the marketers. And a lot of times they'll just, you know, they'll flounder back out It's because they weren't they didn't have the drive plus they didn't have the customer in mind and so standing out is not that hard and also if you have the endurance to continue going uh you're going to outlive the rest of the people that are just going to find themselves outside the game again um i mean 90 percent of marketers out there right now are just like clipboard salesmen you know they're just trying to you know vouchers here if you ever seen a chiropractic ad it's 
hilarious. I can always use this as a model because it's always the same. If you were to go like, let's say ads manager or just look at any ad for any chiropractor, it's like, hey, $49 deal. We've only got 21 vouchers. This is my grand opening scale, like blah, 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 blah. It's, just, it's verbatim. It's like copy and paste for every chiropractor in the world. It's terrible. Um, and it's only getting the bottom of the barrel. Um, and I'm not sure how they haven't learned that yet because I, I, I've worked with plenty of chiropractors and seeing the, the lead flow that's coming in is just trash. Like these people, it's like the people that show up to a barbecue. They're like, oh, I heard there was going to be free food, like free hot dogs or like you show up to an event or so, oh, there's free food. You know, it's those people that are coming in, not mm. the people that are actually going to be spending money or have the money to, you know, actually continue on with the, the, the buyer process. Are you so, familiar with the joint? Yeah, the joint chiropractic. Yeah, yeah the big dude, franchise. They cracked the code, bro. They cracked yeah. the code. I love, I love the joint, bro. Uh, <laughs> I became a customer like years ago. They're all over Houston. Now they're popping up everywhere. I was actually going to open one, man, but unfortunately, there's like this law that you have to be a doctor to own a business, uh, like a chiropractic place no yeah like in new in some states have that law some states don't so in Mm. like jersey and new york you have to basically have a doctor sponsor you so you could yeah it's 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 crazy legal shit but um anyways yeah dude they cracked the code bro with with the chiropractic business because bro people go you go to chiropractor and they're like well you got to come here for the rest of your life (laughs) two times a week (laughs) It's a hundred bucks a session. Yep. All right. Well, I'm not coming in. The joint, you know, they got their little uh, come in whenever you want kind of deal. And, uh, you know, you pay a monthly fee. Subscription-based companies, man. It's blowing up. Yeah. Everything's going that way. Even pest control now. Even pest control. I mean, you'd think that, you know, when you've got pests, you would come up. But, you know, invest for the entire year. Do a monthly and then, then we'll take care of you the entire time. So 90% yeah. of the time, they don't have to do any additional work. So they're just getting that revenue. It's building that EFT model, that electronic fund transfer. That's so. it, bro. Yeah. I, so I'm always thinking, you know, entrepreneurs like us, we're, the mind never sleeps, right? I'm, so I'm yeah. always thinking, like, what could I make subscription model? So the other day, I'm like, ah, what about a toothbrush subscription, right? Everybody needs new toothbrushes, right? Yeah, they already got the razor blades. I go on Google. <laughs> Tooth, sign up now. Toothbrush, toothbrush, toothbrush. I'm like, damn, man. Somebody's created everything already, bro. It's crazy. Somebody yep, out there created it. It's not the first. It's just who can stand out. It's like Dollar Shave Club, and then they had Henry um, that came out too. Uh, there's so much room in the market. It's crazy. Lyft and Uber. It's nice. Yeah, that's a good, very good point, bro. Very, very good point. Uh, Dustin, I want to, I want to switch gears here, bro. I want to, I want to go back in time, man. So we can learn more about you and your upbringing, you know, how, how you kind of got to where you are today, man. So, uh, first off, um, where are you from originally? Originally I am from Boise, Idaho. Uh, I was raised through, um, until about 12. So let's say about six to 12. I was in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada came back down and then I've just kind of bounced around myself, uh, lived in San Francisco, Seattle for a while. So toyed around on the West coast. Mm, nice man. So you used to live in Vegas. You went to elementary school out there in middle school. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was not the, the funnest experience <laughs> as a kid. You know, you go back now, it's totally different, but, yeah. uh, yeah, as a kid, no. Um, I, I would like to say, you know, I had the best upbringing, you know, we lived out in Henderson and we had like all this fun stuff, but no, I went out there and my dad owned a a landscaping company and I had four sisters. So we all moved out there. Uh, Originally it started out nice. We had a nice big house and then all of a sudden uh, we were getting kicked out of the house. (laughs) Um, So my parents ended up losing, you know, all their money, got into drug habits, uh, lost our house, ended up actually staying with the lady that ended up buying our house uh later down the road which was weird um but yeah so getting into drug habits kind of bouncing around from hotel to hotel apartment apartment you know random house rental random house rental Uh, after school i didn't really have a friend life i would just go help my dad uh lots of palm trees out there so lots of stuff there um you know they would be doing like 
waterfall builds and so i would just be working with him so that's all i knew was school and work school and work uh father was a uh more mentally abusive uh so definitely had put those limiting beliefs and stuff on me so um he had his expectations i think were just too high for his uh his parenting skills so you know just any any anything that didn't meet his expectation of a of a son uh was just kind of put out there and then the uh, the daddy's little girls so that that's where he had his um but yeah they would disappear for like weeks at time weeks at a time man um which is just kind of crazy but the the craziest thing about it is when i when i moved back to boise the reason for that was you know those um you know those old school uh not raffle but you, you go door to door and you sell some stuff and then you get to win little prizes if the kids sold enough which is just yeah like, like the, the scholastic uh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. This, this weird way to get child labor, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so so our school had one of those. And um, so throughout those times, my parents would just disappear or we didn't have food or, or what was going on. We uh, would go to door to door and sell those. And uh, there was nothing going on. So you can only do that for so long when people aren't actually getting the stuff that they bought uh, until somebody catches on. Uh, so child services caught on, picked us up, and that was right around 9-11. Um, and then uh, it, it worked out that I actually was going to go back to Boise uh, and live with my grandma. So after that, moved in with my grandma. Uh, through those experiences, I was just kind of an angry kid. So I put her through the ringer. <laughs> I put her through the ringer, but she was relentless and, uh, and helped me get through what I needed to get through. And from that point, it just spurred my, uh, uh, my journey. And it's, I think that's, that's fed into my, my energy and my, my, my drive and my perseverance to kind of do better, uh, mm. as first as a parent, um, uh, for people altogether. And, uh, as an entrepreneur, um, school just wasn't my thing. Went to college, uh, dropped out, I, uh, at, in 11th grade, went to college for like two years thought it would be something different but it wasn't <laughs> and uh left that went to the fitness and kind of just learned my way up so you said you dropped out of high school 11th grade and yeah 11th grade did got you go my GED. GED? okay yeah and then yeah that did the that thing uh, college is, thing yep went to college went to boise state um uh, I was going to go in for, I mean, I always loved the mind. I was like, and, and that's kind of think what has led me into the marketing is, is the buyers, you know, entering the buyer's mind, the buyer persona. And so I was going into psychology and business, which is, is kind of the same route that I've ended up in today and uh, figured out that I was taking like 90% electives. I'm like, this sucks. I was like, I'm paying too much for this stupid crap. So I left, went into fitness. Um, How do you then, pay for uh, university? Uh, I got government grants, so I did that and then ended up, you know, still paying on those things. I'm just letting them go slowly. So, mm. so but, you're, yeah. you're still paying for the loans and the, in, that you had to take out to go to school. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe soon those will just be forgiven. <laughs> yeah. There's talks uh, about it, right? I, I don't know. Uh, not a big fan of that. I was like, if you, if you do something, you pay for it. I mean, that, that's just how my mind goes. Like, I wouldn't go into a business and be like, hey, you just served me, you know, dinner. But the government says that you should do it for free. So, hey, can I get it for free? Like, like, <laughs> like or don't argue myself. it, bro. Just, just <laughs> let them, let them take care of it. <laughs> don't but, don't yeah. argue it, man. Just yeah. let them, let them pay uh, it for you, bro. <laughs> Uh, did wait? Did you graduate or did you drop out? Uh, I I dropped out at at, at two years. Um, ventured off in my own way. It just wasn't wasn't my thing. Unless I was I was medicated because that's highly ADD ADHD. Um, unless I was medicated, I just didn't have the attention span for something like that. It just wasn't engaging to me. Um, one time when I was me me medicated, I had like a four point one. I was like, all right, well, I know I'm smart. Uh, this just isn't for me. Mm. So, um. I dedicated my energy to something I was passionate about and I didn't have an issue with attention at that point, got into sales, used my energy to the best of my ability. And, uh, it's led me to where I'm at today. And, um, uh, personally, I think I'm, 
well versed and educated in in the sales side of things as well as the marketing side of things and it's just constantly has my attention that's the thing with uh i've noticed with add and adhd or any sort of tension disorder or or any i mean let's just say even passion or something that you want to do um it has to engage you on it on a, a whole nother spectrum in order for you to really dive into it um because when when you've got that it's it's like it's, it's like you've got like a, a filter, like a, a blurry filter, you know, a lens where you just you can't quite see it just because it's, it's just not quite there when it, something's not engaging. So if I'm like going researching like World War Two back in those school days and just like glazed over, like, yeah, done. If I'm looking up like anatomy and, and, and exercise and fitness or psychology or something that's super engaging to 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 what I'm, I'm on a mission for. I'm in it. Like I'm, I'm done. So, yeah. Uh, and it's so, it's crazy how like our attention spans get low, like lower and lower for content that doesn't interest us. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know if you're on TikTok, but I can <laughs> like in a millisecond, I can know if I'm going to swipe or not. But if yeah. it's just bizarre, man, and it's important as, as marketers to, to understand that short form content, right? Like, how do you really capture somebody's attention within a millisecond? Yeah. Um, it's obviously like within the first three seconds, but the average attention span on for somebody on searching on social media or, or scrolling, I think this, the latest statistic is the average person scrolls about the height of the Eiffel Tower every single day, um, which is just unfathomable. It's just crazy. Uh, Are you would serious? Spend that much time. Yeah. Uh, and when you think about it, yeah, like that's you don't really put like a height to your scroll just because it's on your small little screen, but it just goes and goes. And I don't goes. know, man. I might be like power. Burj Khalifa level, bro. <laughs> I'd be I, I'd be swiping, man. <laughs> Dude, I don't know, man. So the, the three second thing and, and I don't know this like scientifically. Dude, I think it's less than three seconds, bro. I, depending on which platform, because like TikTok, man, dude. Three seconds into a fifteen second TikTok feels like a long time. Oh yeah. Yeah. Three seconds is is where generally, you know, if you search the marketing industry where people will say, but it's about uh, the average attention span for someone online is about one point eight seconds. So if somebody's watching about 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds of that video, they're engaged. So you already know that that's something that it re is relatable to them. And that's something I use specifically in, in, in all marketing strategies I work for within a company um, is, is video. Video is, is amazing. It's, it's an easy, excellent way to, to figure out if, company, if a, a prospect is actually engaged in your content. If they're, because if you're scrolling through and auto plays on, it will register it if they just like scroll and it starts auto playing. So you, you've got all these people that are about three seconds, four seconds, five seconds, or just it goes uh, that just you're wasting money on. Mm. Uh, and then you can't read, you can't retarget to something like that. If you're just posting a video, uh, a picture, which pictures are great. But if you've got videos, you can track everything. If they watched 25% of the video, 50% of the video, 75% of the video, 95% of the video, so if they're watching 20 seconds of your video, when the average attention span of somebody that's 1.8 seconds, they're engaged. Let's just say you send them a second video or you put you, the, you, you frequent, you block everybody into one group or an audience and you send them a second video and they're, you know, they're also engaged. They're again, watching 50, 75, 85, 95% of that video. Mm. that person is warmed up. They now know you, you've created value for them. They trust you on a different level. So that direct response marketing that everybody does on the front end, trying to just be clipboard salesman, you know, now you can throw that in on the third or the fourth or the fifth video. Now that you've created some awareness of your brand, some authority, some relationship, and you can even specifically call these people out saying like, Hey, I know you've seen a couple of my videos or, or any of those things because you, you know, the actions that they've taken, and then you can throw that direct response out because you're also front of mind aware uh, within that per with your per prospect's mind. But in the industry, 90% of people are just like, buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this, mm. discount, 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 discount. It just, um, rather than 
playing that long game, like I, like I mentioned before, and actually creating a relationship with the person, um, understanding them, the actions that they take, uh, and then filtering out the cold audience that just doesn't care about you or isn't your prospective buyer. Because right now, if you're doing direct response, you're also paying those costs in the auction for all those people that don't care about you because you're paying higher costs because you're asking for an action. But if you're paying for engagement, you're not paying those high costs, but you get to siphon all of those cold audience people out that don't care about you. You get to just throw them out of the bucket and then market to the warm audience you've already nurtured. So that's where you get to drive a lot of costs down and build that long-term brand authority. So for running, so, okay. So and for the listeners out there, we're, we're talking running ads, right? Uh, yeah. advertising for your small business, anybody that's not familiar with, uh, you know, running ads and such, uh, there, there's multiple different types of ads that you can run different objectives. And you mentioned running engagement campaigns versus conversion campaigns. If I heard you correctly. Correct. Okay. Uh, so yeah. just, just show the ad to as many people as possible. I want people to like the ad, not click buy now. Is that right? Want people to watch. Watch. Uh, so you're doing video views and engagement. So video, you want them okay. To actually engage. So if you've got a video, let's just say, okay, so let's map this out. So if you've got a video, um, this is there's no ask here. There's no ask whatsoever. It's value. Something like the on the front end where you're just, let's just say you're uh, uh, fitness. So you're gonna give some direct information to somebody about fitness on something that they could do. Can we can we use real estate as an example? Awesome. Okay, real estate. So let's say what who's your who's your prospect? So you're looking for a buyer seller, you're looking for seller. Uh, re- somebody who wants seller. to sell their distressed property. Okay, somebody that wants to sell their distressed property. Okay, so let's say you may be obviously that's not my particular profession, but you may have let's say a list of particular things that uh, this person should knew, know before doing that or let's say a couple of things that they could do now in order to make more money whenever they do do that or you know these types of valuable things that they can do that they could do themselves but they're not going to people will hire other people for that reason because it takes them a lot longer in order to do that um you know there are the stubborn few but 90 percent of the people will still just they'll just have you do it um you could give out this value and this information that 90 percent of the people that you're marketing to that are trying to sell a distressed property don't know anything about so you're going to create value and they'll be like, wow, I didn't know that. Okay, this guy is now um, giving me value. He's, he's obviously maybe an expert, you know, because, you know, he knows all this stuff that I don't know. You've got authority. They trust you. They know your face. They know your brand. So that now you're not asking them anything. You just gave them a video. And now we know all the people that watch throughout this entire video, the cold people, they don't really, they're not trying to sell a distressed property. They're not trying, you know, the people that just kind of came, the, you know, the flies that circled around, uh, they're not your target market. We, we are not going to send them another video. They're mm. not going to see video too. They're not going to see any of our next sales process. So also we are not clogging up the value because Facebook likes value. If people aren't engaging in your content, then they're not going to show it and you're going to bid higher in the auction and you're just going to waste more money. So we're not going to show it to them. We're going to show the second video, which is something else, uh, maybe of value or uh, identifying you and your authority a little bit more while also giving value. Now they see two videos. You're front of mind. Um, you've developed trust, your authority. You know, they're warmed up. Okay, they may may not be really hot, but they're warmed up. Second or third vid or third or fourth video is where you would do more of a call to action. Let's just say if you have a low barrier or you're inviting them to a webinar or you're inviting them to a, a consultation or you've got an ebook you're going to give out to them, a very low barrier or something, that's where your call to action is. And then these people are warm. You've sifted out the front of the cold. And on the second video, you've sifted out more cold. And then on the third video, maybe you'll sift out more cold or you could just go direct to, directly into the call to action. And that is where your, your cost per lead is just done. It's, it's nothing. Plus, your conversions are, are through the roof mm. uh, because you're no longer marketing to these cold audiences. And you literally got all these views and you created this, this audience, which now you can create a lookalike audience off of, um, for pennies. I mean, I've, I've seen them at even like a fourth of a penny. 
So, I mean, you're, you're paying nothing. That's, that's gold, bro. That's gold. That's a, that's a, that's a golden bomb right there, man. I like that. So run an ad, position yourself as the authority. So people are comfortable with you and maybe not now, but when the time comes, if they think, Hey, I need to sell my house. This is the guy or the girl that I'm going to give right. a call to. And that's why that low barrier too. So like that ebook, that something, when you do that ask, mm. that's also just going to put them into a nurture system because that's going to get their phone number. That's going to get maybe their, their zip code. So you can get back end information on obviously uh, the real estate in that area. Um, and it's going to get their phone number. So then you've got them in a text sequence. You've got an email sequence. You've got them in a retargeting sequence. So you're retargeting them with other points of value or other types of things. Um, You've got them in all these different levels now. So they're they're in your zone. And so whenever they are ready or if they are ready or hot at that exact point in time, then you just run them through the sales process. Mm, I like so, that, man. What do you what do you think about print? Print ads. Print? So like uh mailers? Uh magazines, those little classified papers that go around lo- the local towns. Um, uh, if your demographic is uh, the older age group, yeah, um, or housewives, you mm-hmm. know, maybe ages forty and up, but um, they do have uh, have their place. I mean, uh, gyms still use them uh, as long as they're not putting too much money into it. It can be lucrative, uh, but personally, that's that's not something I dive into just because I know that you know why would you why would you if you know that you could put your money in one bucket. And double it, if not more. But if you put your other your dollar in the other bucket, you know you don't have you can't track the data, so you don't have their phone number. That you you can't track any of that information. You also can't retarget to them without spending the same amount of money, and you might get like seventy five cents back. Mm-hmm. Why would you put it in that bucket if you can put it in this bucket? So that's where I double down in because I already know the data is there. It makes a lot of sense. You can't really you, you can't track analytics if you're like how, you can't. I mean, billboards, right? You can't track analytics on billboards either, but people still do them. So, what, what do you? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, they have their place, uh, and they've got some weird, uh, weird things coming forward. You know, it's a funny side thing. You know, you remember back when like Google Glass was going to come out with the little camera on the lenses? Yeah. And everybody's just like, everybody's thro- <laughs> Gosh, right? Well, the thing is, is because everybody was throwing a fit because of their their own personal privacy because those things could be recording at any time. Um, And what's funny now is nobody cares about their own personal privacy. They want to be tracked everywhere. They want to be, you know, limited to their home. Um, And then billboards as well. They're also trying to um, figure out their own analytics by facial recognition on certain, on certain levels now. So uh, all the passing by cars, tracking numbers there and then by facial recognition and and geo tracking using obviously like google um and, and apple tracking um to figure out exactly who was in that area to remarket to them as well or to serve them an ad that is um you know it's kind of like uh like zyro like my partner he he his data points are like what are their uh what they did in one restaurant may contribute to what they get offered in another restaurant something like that mm. so uh, that's also kind of maybe the future of billboards but people are, are just not caring about their their privacy more these days dude it's over scary. bro like look if you if you have a cell phone in your phone in your pocket you're you you're done they know everything yeah. about you oh gosh they yeah. know they know it all so the people that claim pri- i need privacy pri- it's it, if you if you use social media, you're done. Like they know everything yeah. about you. <laughs> I saw this viral video, man, on TikTok. Like somehow this guy figured out a way. I don't know. Turned his camera on. It was some software, and he just waved it around his house, and it literally started like identifying everything, like uh, flat screen TV, computer, and like it's just pointing out all these the, the things, like art piece on wall. And it said exactly what it was. And I'm like, what the heck? This is insane. Like, you could literally just, like, what if you just turn on your camera to take a selfie and your phone is submitting information to somebody like, yeah. 
He he doesn't have a couch in his living room. He needs a couch. <laughs> Set him a couch, Ed. You know, yeah, it's, right. it's 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 crazy, man. It's Nuts. funny you see it. You see it in like these future movies and stuff where you see like uh, like AI or something that's just like scanning scanning certain areas or whatever, and then like seeing like faces and then and then finding their 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 identity and then all their background information and stuff. It's it's not far off or it's already there. That's like it's exactly what it's doing. Um, I mean, if you've seen the amount of data that Teslas pick up while they're driving, it's just insane. If you see it on more of the the actual behind the camera data vision, like how it recognizes like a bus, a truck, a person, a kid, a pedestrian, their speed, where they're going. It's just insane. Right. How? How, how does <laughs> it's, it's wild stuff. It has a much larger uh, end game with that amount of data that's coming in. Because if they can add like um, like facial recognition or anything else to that, like the that amount of data that they can just sell is just crazy. Yeah. Elon's a mad genius too. So he I is. wouldn't hold it past him to be doing some crazy he, things. He is, man. There, there, there's a lot of very fascinating things out there that just – Blow Bobby. my mind, bro. Like you, you know which one I just blow. It just blows my mind. Like I, I cannot comprehend this. How is it that your phone's GPS right knows every route, every every stop sign, the speed limit, precisely? How? Like how was this created? Well, the, have you ever seen one of those little Google cars? I, I have. Well, I haven't seen one personally. I've seen them online. Yeah, I've seen them driving around, and they update all the time. They're everywhere. So they, they literally just drive the route with those crazy cameras on the roof, and they track everything. So they take pictures of everything, and then they track the speed limits. So the speed limit signs, the algorithm is, is meant to actually pull that information um, and figure it out. Plus, obviously, they also have like... Uh, other maps and data points and stuff that they get. But yeah, that's it's it's crazy. But what about traffic, man? Live traffic shows oh, up. They're using everyone's location that they have on. So like if you have Google Maps and they probably have partner partnerships with other map map sources. So if you have your location point on, they know that people are congregating in that one area for a longer period of time. So then it turns orange or yellow or red. So they know that there's like, okay, well this intersection usually has like ten people. Now it has 40 people. Um, so that's where that's congregated. But at like, scale, though, Dustin, how? How? Totally. We're talking the entire world. Like every city. Dude, like, they've got so Live. Cool. Like how? <laughs> how? Like <laughs> your, if you go out in your, in your city and I go out in my city, we're both getting real time traffic data live 24 7. Aliens, bro. It's, it's it has to be it has to be google's google's they're too powerful man they they they, yeah, they, yeah. they got some other stuff happening but i mean you could even use that like gps could use essentially potential like customer behavior like oh this person mm -hmm. takes this route every morning 7 a.m there's a dunkin donuts on the corner we're going to show them an ad for a Dunkin', you know, essentially, right? Like, well, I mean, that's, that's essentially what they are doing. It's kind of the same thing with Facebook. So, like, whether you're people that are in the area, people that are living in the area, people that are passing by, um, those are segmented by people that are just either reside in that area by the uh, address location that they have or people that are just from a different city or a different area that are traveling by. Um, and then you can just stamp maybe a one mile or even geotag or even specify a specific zip code and anybody that's like even passing within that zone then they get hit with it right um it's kind of like I, i've worked with some personal injury lawyers it's the same thing with um because they can't really like predict an accident um but that's their main main thing so it's it's being creative with your targeting and targeting like let's say specific hospitals that's the first place they're going to go if they're injured is a hospital so then they get hit with an ad mm. You know, uh, so it's, it's different types of things like that. But yeah, it's it's insane. Uh, I don't know how they real time set up all that data, man. It just boggles my mind, but it's done. So I like the ads that don't look like ads, you know, like mm -hmm. those 
those ads that you watch and you're like, wait, that's an ad? What the heck? And uh, I also like the influencer marketing model as well. I want, I'm yeah. curious to know your thoughts on that. So right now on TikTok, that's like what's blowing up. There's all these companies. They're throwing tons of money at these creators. Like, bang. Bang, beat yeah. like. They like beat the game at advertising. They're, I don't, I've never even seen a bang ad. All I see is people drinking bang in their videos. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on influencer marketing versus running your own campaigns? Uh, I would say at some point they need to merge. Um, but I, I totally believe in influencer marketing. The only thing is you have to know your audience. You can't just get, uh, you know, find this girl that loves poking, ha posting half naked pictures that most of her followers are just weird dudes behind their computer. And, you know, she may have five million, but you have a product. It's not going to reach the majority of the audience as a product that they're going to be looking for. So uh, that's where like micro influencers or people with a very warmed up audience that consumes their content on a regular basis and it's very consistent um, versus let's say if they've got 3 million followers, but only 200,000 people engage consistently and the rest are just trash. Um, you have to know where you're spending your money. You have mm. to know the audience. You have to know the analytics. Unless you're Chipotle. Everybody loves Chipotle. <laughs> you, you don't need to know your, uh, cause I, I right. watch these, these streamers on Twitch and they're always sponsored by like Grubhub, like Taco Bell. <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> People need to yeah, eat, they, right? Wendy's. They need to eat, so they can't leave the keyboard. Yep. <laughs> man, um, crazy stuff, bro. Thanks for sharing that value with us, man. You definitely, uh, you definitely know your know what you're talking about when it comes to marketing, man. Very important stuff. You know, I'm curious, bro. Um, what's your day to day look like right now, December 2020? Like, what are you focused on? How do you spend your time? What's that? You know, talk to us. I have a three month old, so so there is that <laughs> diapers formula. <laughs> yep, yep. Ah, dude. Okay, side note, baby stuff. Have you ever heard of a windy? A windy? Yeah. No. Nah. What's that? Okay. So, um, my daughter has has we figured out she has like uh she's very susceptible, and a lot of babies are too, like dairy. So she gets gassy sometimes, and when they're gassy, it's it's hard to to resolve that issue and they're just crying and crying and crying but there's this or you can medicate and I, I mean i don't like going that route if i don't have to but there is a uh it's just this little windy thing that's designed out it almost looks like it was on a 3d printer but it's kind of like plastic and it's uh it's got a little tip and you just put like coconut oil on it and it's, it's a little tube and you just put it right in the butt <laughs> and instant relief Dude, it is the best thing in the world. Instant relief. Like the baby's crying and then happy face. No and way. Goes. Yeah. I'm just like, what? this is the best investment ever. This thing is amazing. And that's crazy. No, I never <laughs> heard of that, man. Yeah. That's but, wild. Uh, but that saved that saved us. Other than that, our, my baby is 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 super easy, and I have a rock star wife that takes care of of majority of the uh, the heavy heavy lifting, uh, as I would put it. But other than that, I mean, always, always fill in the pipeline, man. Um, you, what you're doing today is going to affect you 60 to 90 days down the road. And so, you know, if, if you don't have that pipeline filled, then later down the road, you're going to have the repercussions from that because you, you can't rely on what you have right now. It's like the fitness industry did not do well during COVID. A lot of my clients were fitness industry. So clearly that did not work in my favor. So mm. I had to pivot. I had to pivot. Uh, and you know, the good thing is, is I didn't niche down. I don't, a lot of marketers say that niche down. I don't, I don't believe in that really much. Uh, it, the, the fundamentals stay the same. It's, and I, I love a challenge and it's really just understanding the end user, um, and the, the prospect, the, the customer avatar that you're trying to reach and, and find that message. Uh, so pivoting was fairly easy for me, but still picking up the pieces because gyms are, still aren't doing well. What, what what did you mean by niche down? Uh, finding a specific niche. So let's just say I'm a marketer and I only work with gyms or I'm a marketer and I only work with chiropractors. Uh, I don't believe in that. 
Um, I can, I mean, I haven't found a, a client or a niche or that I haven't found, been able to get results for. Um, uh, some can niche down because they're going to be like, well, I'm the, you know, I'm the chiropractor guy. I'm the real estate guy. I'm this guy. Uh, I'm the marketer that is going to get you results. So, mm, okay. Understood. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, so a lot of that is, is prospecting. I always got to fill the line. Uh, that's my main, main portion of my day, uh, and then fulfillment. Uh, but I have been able to, uh, train and develop, um, virtual assistants as well as, as staff and also partnerships with other agencies that, um, may be better at some particular elements that, that I have, um, that handle a lot of fulfillment. Otherwise I would just be I'd be done. That would, that'd be all I was doing all day. And at some point you have to replace yourself. Otherwise you, you the bottleneck starts at you. So, um, my best time is spent prospecting, um, because on that sales side right now, eventually I do want to release that out a little bit further and then do, uh, take a step back, but that's going to be closer to the point where I actually start uh, taking ideas on selling the agency. So, mm, interesting. Good stuff, man. Well, hey, at least you could do, I'm sure, the majority of your work from home, right? Uh, yep. On the computer. So you don't have to worry about going out and getting that get COVID, man. Getting uh, the Rona. Getting the Rona. Yeah, man. Jim's got freaking clobbered, bro. Crazy, yeah, man. Did. Crazy, crazy, I, crazy. I interviewed uh, Miguel Aguilar out in San uh, he lives in uh, Temecula, California. He owns a like 60 plus gym franchise, real estate business, water company, all kinds of stuff. Um, he, he is shadow banned. Like you have to type his entire name on Instagram in order for them to find you because he's a super advocate for an, like shutdowns, like against shutdowns, shutdowns and anything. Um, but yeah, he gave him two weeks. And after that, he's like, uh, uh-uh, I'm done. I'm staying open. He has not closed down more than t- the two weeks for the very beginning since the start. Any really? Of looking, any of his gyms. Yeah. Wow. I mean, but, it's, it's, a, it's, I, I, look, I'm no official, but it's like a great, yeah. it's like, t- dude, like, how could you, how could you let people go to a bar, but they can't go to the gym? Like, I mean, yeah, that's the, that's the craziest you thing. You can't, like, you know, like, a lot of these things. Yeah. I, I mean, here in Idaho, even the health district was like, there's no proof that gyms are a spreader location. Um, and a lot of these, these people as well, like they're healthy. They're, they're literally going there to exercise and work out. They're, they're not the group that's 94%, you know, of the, or 6% mortality, 4% mortality or whatever. They're the 99.9.1, you know. Um, and even like Ian Smith, he's got a gym as well out in New Jersey out in, yeah, I'm pretty sure Jersey too. Um, he hadn't shut down either. He turned his into a, like a political, uh, partnership with a, a Republican candidate out there so he could stay open from governor Murphy, but he tracks every single person that comes in and they go so far beyond even hospitals cleanliness. And he hasn't had like one single COVID. And one of the owners of that gym had his mom die from COVID too. And he's just like, this is just crazy. He's like, it's going to happen. But like, look at the stats. Like if you want the stats, cause they're not giving us the stats. They're just telling us that we can't do this. Mm. But they're like, here's the stats that we have. And we're doing more than all government agencies. And these are the stats that we have. You can take our stats and then model your new models off of that. But it's outside, crazy, my, outside my pay grade, bro. Yeah. I just I just stay in my lane, man. These, you know <laughs> they're gonna do what they what they're gonna do at the end of the day, man. You know. Yeah, I mean it's it's in the end, well, you get people like you and me, man. People like your listeners, people the entrepreneurs that are gonna persevere. It doesn't matter what curveballs we're given, we're gonna succeed. So that's it, brother. You had no choice, right? Yeah. Go- government ain't the government ain't doesn't paying. Matter. Nope. They said they're not paying anymore. <laughs> you got to sink or you got to swim, man. It's up to it's up to you. Uh, I could go on and on and on, bro. But we're limited <laughs> on time, man. Um, <laughs> Dustin, bro, for the people that are listening, you know, they're tuned in. They're rocking with you, man. They like your story. They like what you got going on. What's your message to them, man? What's your message to the people? What do you want people to know about you? Like that one thing, man, That one that one golden nugget. That one golden nugget. Uh, no, the past is in the past, man. Just uh, 
whatever your history is, it doesn't uh, it it doesn't paint the picture of your future. So just uh, daily compounding action, whatever your goal is, whether you're an established business owner, uh, the message still stays true. Whether you're a new to business and you're going into a different industry, uh, just get 1% better. Just do a, a new task every single day and you'll get there. It's the long game. It's not the short game. You're not, it's not that way in marketing. It's not that way in business. Uh, you're not going to get there looking for the instant gratification. Play the long game. Just every single day, do something new and compound that and you're going to get to where you want to get to um and uh just have your own core values established uh uh -huh. because if you're if you're not going to be um uh, an ethical business uh history tells you're not going to succeed so always uh, put the customer first and if you provide you're going to get 10 times back it's just proven always great advice man i love it Dustin, you also run a podcast yourself, man. Tell us about that. Tell us about where the viewers can check you out, follow you, follow your journey, and learn from you. Definitely. Uh, my Instagram is at Dustin Reyna, uh, Facebook at Dustin Reyna, LinkedIn at Dustin Reyna, at Dustin Reyna, everything. Uh, my podcast is The Dedication to Excellence, um, and it, it still follows the same morals and ethics and core values that I put through on here. Um, I was tired of a lot of the um, regurgitated fluff uh, without actionable steps. I like to actually give you something that you can take, walk away, apply, and see results with. Um, and that's the Dedication of Excellence, um, De Dedication to Excellence podcast. Uh, you can find us on every single platform, uh, the Instagram as well. Um, and, you know, we're just rising. We actually had the amazing Ross Alex here on the podcast as well. <laughs> Episode it's dropping good time. soon. Good time, yeah. man. Good conversation. Yeah, yeah Absolutely. That, that's me, man. It's All right. Me. Yeah, and we'll link some uh, some of your socials in the show notes. And uh, with that being said, man, Dustin, it was a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for stopping by. And uh, stay safe, brother. Enjoy the rest of your day. You as well. Thanks so much for having me, man. Take care.